Um, our next speaker this afternoon is Lauren Smith. Lauren hails from Spring Grove, Illinois, and is a biology major here at the University of Dubuque. Um, Lauren is a fixture in the Goldthorpe Science, Goldthorpe Science Building, and it seems to me that perhaps she only leads to sleep and play golf. I know that Lauren is a great science student, and she must also be a pretty good golfer. She's captain of the women's golf team. Lauren's career goals include attending graduate school for a degree focusing on molecular biology, which she'll be giving us a strong dose of this afternoon as she educates us on all things orchids. Please join me in welcoming Lauren. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Lauren, and the title of my research project was The Role of TCP Genes in Determining Plant Architecture and Floral Development in Orchids. So first, I'd like to start off and make sure everybody's on the same page here. So out of these six pictures, can anyone tell me which of them are orchids? C. Any others? What did you say? E. Actually, the correct answer is C and D. And can anyone tell me why? A little louder. Okay. Yes. Anything else? Okay. You got it. They are orchids because, if I can get this thing to work. OK. They exhibit bilateral symmetry, which means if you cut them right down the middle, it'll be the same on both sides. And they have this funky looking organ here called a lip. So this brings me to the next question. Of these six pictures, which of them are orchids? <laughs> Correct answer. It's a trick question. They're all orchids, but you will notice that these two down the bottom are a little funky looking because they don't have bilateral symmetry. They actually have radial symmetry. This one on the left has three petals, and that one on the right has three lips. So why is that? Um, this is a particular flower that we worked with. It's called Dendrobium, and as you can see on the left is the normal flower and what it should look like. It has bilateral symmetry and a lip. And on the right is the mutant, and it's actually superimposed 180 degrees. Oh, sorry. So this petal up here should actually be a lip, and it exhibits radial symmetry. So before I go into everything that we're looking at, I want to make sure everybody knows about transcription, which is the copying of DNA into RNA by RNA polymerase. So as you can see in this diagram, the RNA polymerase is on the template DNA strand down here. And as it runs across, it encodes for the RNA coming off here. And RNA is needed in all living things to code for proteins for biological functions. Next, it brings me to transcription factors. And transcription factors are proteins that bind to the specific DNA elements and regulate transcription. Um, and so these transcription factors can either promote or block transcription. In this diagram up here, up top, sorry, <laughs> you can see um, there is no transcription factor here, so there is no transcription happening. And down here, the transcription factor is present, so there will be transcription taking place. So now that brings me to the genes that we are specifically looking at, which are TCP genes. And TCP genes are actually genes that encode for these transcription factors that cause transcription to happen. And so TCP is an acronym for the genes that make up this family. T stands for Teosinte branch one, which controls the apical dominance, branching pattern, and plant architecture. C stands for cycloidea, which controls the floral symmetry. And P stands for proliferating cell nuclear antigen binding factors one and two, which are involved in cell division. Um, there's also another gene that we're interested in called Cincinnata which controls the petal lobe growth and leaf curvature in the plants. And these TCP genes have mainly been studied in plants such as Arubidopsis, Antirhinum, and Zea maize, and not so much in orchids, which is why we're interested in them. So the overall goals for this uh, research project were to isolate as many of the TCP genes that we could from our dendrobium plant. We then wanted to put those genes into an expression pattern to see where they're being expressed and how intensely. From there, we want to develop a phylogenetic tree of all the genes we're able to isolate, which will all contribute to the long-term goal of determining how these TCP genes shape the plant architecture and floral development in orchids. So first, TSNT branch one. It regulates plant architecture, but more specifically, the branching pattern. Um, there's similar uh, 
branching patterns, as you can see in corn and orchids. So in this picture, you can see here we have the ancient corn called teosinte, and it exhibits sporadic branching. And then on the right is our modern corn that we see all over Iowa with a single stem with stalks coming off the sides. The same can be seen in orchids, whereas um, similar to the modern corn that we have now, um, a single stem with flowers coming off the sides, and similar to the teosinte would be sympodial, which has uh, many branches with flowers coming off. So we hypothesize that there is a gene similar to TB1 that is responsible for these different growth habits. Next is cycloidia. And cycloidia and dichotoma genes control floral bilateral symmetry in antirhinum flowers, which is on the right. Up top is the wild type flower, and as you can see, it demonstrates bilateral symmetry. And on the bottom, when these two genes are mutated, it um, exhibits radial symmetry. However, we run into a problem because cycloidia is not found in monocots, which is what orchids are. They're only found in dicots. However, come back to that, there is a TB1-like gene known as Retardia Paleo 1 that is at least partially responsible for the bilateral symmetry in rice, and rice is a monocot like our orchids. Last is the proliferating cell factors 1 and 2, and they regulate cell proliferation. So if these genes are mutated, they can either, if they're down-regulated, the plant won't grow at all because all things need cell division to live. And if they're over-regulated, you'll get what is seen in this picture where here is a normal flower or plant, and uh, here's a mutant who has the PCF over-regulated, which means there's an overgrowth of flowers. So back to the Cincinnati gene that I was talking about. Um, here are some examples. Uh, on the left, you'll have a normal flower, or a normal plant, I should say. And next to that would be the mutant. And when the Cincinnati is down-regulated, you'll get the curvy, weird leaves that you see there. And then um, for the flower, you'll see that when Cincinnati is down-regulated, um, the lobe right here is much smaller than in the wild type here, and that's where the mutation is exhibited. So the methods for our gene isolation in this project, first we took our samples and we froze them with liquid nitrogen, and we ground them with a mortar and pestle. We then put those samples into centrifuge tubes and spin it down to separate the RNA. The RNA is then reverse transcribed, whereas transcription is DNA to RNA. We take our RNA and transcribe it into DNA, so it's easier to work with. And that DNA is put into a PCR, which stands for a polymerase chain reaction. And that essentially magnifies the gene that we're trying to isolate many, many times so that we can work with it. After the PCR is done, we add loading dye into our sample. The sample is then put into wells on a gel, as you can see here. And then that gel is hooked up to an electrophoresis machine, which sends electrical currents into it and it causes the DNA to run down the gel. And it'll look something like this. And so we'll have DNA bands, and um, the size of the bands are me measured with a ladder, which you can see here. And once we find the right size that we're looking for, we cut it out, put it into a tube where we can extract the DNA from the actual gel piece. That DNA is then put into a vector and cloned. And that vector is inserted into bacteria so that we can grow it and have several copies of the gene that we want. So once we did that, we, were, we wanted to see where these genes are being expressed. And at first, we looked at developmental expression. So we started with the young bud all the way up into the open flower. And we used actin as our control. And so as you can see here, all of this TCP gene is expressed equally throughout all the different stages of development. So that led us to look at the different organs of the flower. And this is where we saw our results. So you can see here, there is a big difference between the expression of TCP in the lip and the petal. And the lip and the petal together are known as the second whorl of the flower. And to give you a visual of that in the bottom corner, it makes up the two petals and the lip. Not only is there a difference between the lip and the petal, but there is also a difference between the lip and the petal as well as the sepals. And the sepals are known as the second or the first whorl of the flower, sorry. And they can be seen there. Now, 
In addition to all of that, we also see, you might not be able to tell very well on the screen, but there's also a correlation between our TCP gene and MIR319, which is a microRNA gene that Tyson Carter will be talking more about after I'm done. Uh, but as you can see, where there's more TCP, there's less MIR319 and vice versa. So that shows that there is a correlation between the two. So one of our goals was to put together a phylogenetic tree of all the genes we were able to isolate, and this is what we were able to come up with. We have a synclad up here with all the Cincinnati-like genes that we were able to find. Unfortunately, we were, we were not successful in finding a TB1-like gene, even after many, many tries and many primer combinations and months of work. But we're still looking, but this could also suggest that maybe there just isn't a TB1 gene. And these are all the PCF genes that we were able to isolate as well. So in conclusion, we were able to isolate several Cincinnati-like genes as well as a few PCF genes from our dendrobium flower. Our expression profile shows highly variable expression in the different organs of the plant. And the expression pattern of MIR319 correlates with the expression of TCP-like genes, or TCP genes, sorry. There was only TB, one TB1 partial clone found in all the orchestra databases online, which, um, and that was just for one species, and there's 23 different species in all of these databases. Even after, like I said, our repeated attempts to isolate a TB1 gene, we are not successful. So this leads us to new questions as to maybe there isn't a TB1 gene. We aren't sure yet, but we're going to keep looking. And we are currently trying to find strategies to prove the function of the TCP genes that we were able to find by genetic complementation. I would sincerely like to thank Joe and Linda Calafity and the Summer Fellowship for the opportunity that they have given me the R.J. McElroy Trust Student Research Grant, the Women in Science Grant, um, my fellow undergraduate researcher, Tyson Carter, as well as my advisor, Rasika Mudalike Jaya Wikrama. Thank you.